Hello. You probably noticed if you read through the scriptures for this weekend that the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles talks about the ordination of the first deacons in the church. It reminds us that there was a crisis that the apostles had to face, not a terribly big one, but an important one because justice was important to them. We had a lot of widows and orphans in the church and the only way they could be taken care of was from the community chest. And the Greek-speaking widows were complaining that the Hebrew-speaking widows were getting a bigger cut. And the apostles thought, well, that's an important issue. We need to make sure that justice is done and that there's fair distribution. So their solution was brilliant. Uh, they picked seven men that the community knew and respected, and they all had Greek names, and they ordained them the first deacons. And they did this by calling the Holy Spirit down upon them and imposing their hands on them uh, in a gesture that was reminiscent of the way rabbis were ordained in those days. Now the deacons took seriously their work and apparently did a good job on taking care of the proper distribution, but they also understood that their work wasn't exclusive, uh, exclusively uh, distribution of things. They were also preachers. Uh, St. Stephen, the first martyr, was not martyred because of distributing any property. It was because he was an outstanding preacher and he was fearless in proclaiming Jesus to the religious authorities. And for that, um, he didn't really have a trial. They just dragged him out of the city and stoned him to death. So it was completely illegal that he was our first martyr. Now one of the other seven was pretty famous too. Uh, Philip the deacon, not Philip the apostle, uh, had two daughters who were prophetesses, which means that the, the three of them both preached the good news and also apparently were able to go into ecstasies and kind of challenge the community in Jesus' name to do well. Now, they went up to Samaria to spread the good news, and they did so very successfully uh, and came back to rejoicing in the Jerusalem community. Philip then finds himself taken off to a road along the coast where he meets the Ethiopian uh, eunuch uh, who, for the queen of Ethiopia, who's on his way back home, uh, who's reading Jew Hebrew scriptures, who doesn't understand what they mean. And Philip explains that this passage from Isaiah is talking about Jesus. So he teaches him about Jesus, and the eunuch says, well, what's to prevent me from being baptized? There's water right off the road here. So he was baptized, and then the eunuch brought Christianity back to Ethiopia where there's an ancient Christian community to this day. Now we continue to have deacons ministering in the church throughout the whole period of persecution, which began with the death of Stephen and kept going until the year 313. Uh, some of the most famous deacons that came afterwards were St. Lawrence and his companions. Uh, Lawrence was born in Spain in the city of Huesca, and he was he came to Rome and he became one of the deacons under Pope Sixtus II. They were all gathered together in the catacomb on August 7th of 258, celebrating liturgy when they were promptly arrested. And the Pope and seven of the deacons were all executed right on the spot. They were beheaded. Now, Lawrence was told you have a couple of days to gather up the treasure of the church and turn it into the government, and then you can live. Lawrence apparently then was the treasurer, as Stephen had been in the um, earlier centuries. So as you all know, I'm sure from the legend, what Lawrence did was give out all of the money of the church to the poor and bring all of the poor before the governor and say, this is the treasure of the church. Now there's another story that uh, one of the treasures of the church, you've heard of the Holy Grail. Now, is the Holy Grail a myth or is it real? There are some cups in the world that have claimed to being the Holy Grail, but it seems that the one that the popes most respect as being perhaps the actual Holy Grail is a cup that was brought by Peter to Rome and then passed on to the popes a little agate cup that might have been like the Elijah cup at the Last Supper. And then when Sixtus II and the other deacons were martyred, 
Lawrence set, gave that cup to another Spanish close friend of his and said, bring it back to Huesca. So it was brought back to Spain. Now, according to another legend, Lawrence's nephew was a martyr, the third famous uh, deacon martyr, St. Vincent of Saragossa, who was a deacon to that diocese. Lawrence's mother and Vincent's mother were sisters, but Vincent's mother was the, the little sister. And so apparently the cup was kept in their family. And during the persecution of Diocletian in 305, the Bishop Valerian and the Deacon Vincent were both arrested. Now Valerian was let go, but the deacon was told, bring all of the treasures of the church, the literature and anything else you have and turn it in and then you can be let go. But he refused for which he was severely tortured, and he became the proto-martyr of Spain. Um, you'll also see when we kind of look around at some of the things in the church, Vincent is usually depicted with grapes because in the future history of the church, he was regarded as the patron of the wine industry, of drinking, and of hangover because the first syllable of his name, Vin, is a Spanish word, or the vino is Spanish for wine, and Vin is a French word for wine. Uh, the Holy Grail became the Chalice of Valencia, and you can still see it in the Cathedral of Valencia. And we'll take some look at pictures that are about the Holy Grail too, in case you'd like to see them. I'd like to talk to you a bit about deaconesses. You've heard that Pope Francis has talked about reviving the order of deaconesses, and well, he should, because we had them for the first centuries of the church. A couple of the saints deaconesses who are pretty famous, <clears throat> whose relics we have here, St. Apollonia of Alexandria. She was an old woman in the Church of Alexandria in Egypt when she was martyred uh, around the year 250, about the same time St. Uh, Lawrence was martyred. Uh, she was tortured, all of her teeth were pulled out, and then she was burned alive, for which she became the patron of dentistry and the protectress of rotten teeth. Now at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the church fathers at the council decided that they were going to suppress the order of deaconess. I don't know why, except maybe they felt like the women were taking over more authority than they thought they ought to have in the church, and that needs to be researched more. However, we still had deaconesses. St. Olympias was a deaconess in Constantinople, the capital, in around the year 400. St. John Chrysostom, the patriarch, didn't really like women in positions of authority, but he liked Olympias a lot, so she got to do whatever she liked in the leadership of the church. And we also have here relics of another deaconess named St. Radigund. St. Radigund was a Burgundian princess. Her entire family, except her, were murdered by King Clotaire II of France, and he brought her to be his queen, and he was a terribly abusive husband, and eventually she ran away. And she went to Saint Medard, who was the Bishop of Soissons, just for protection. And Medard decided that something he could do to secure her safety more was to ordain her a deaconess. So she was ordained a deaconess, and she eventually became the founding abbess of the uh, convent of the Holy Cross, Saint Croix in Poitiers. So she was a queen, a deaconess, and an abbess. And she died in the year 587. So still the order of deaconess was around in the church. From 325 to 587 we had them. So we have plenty of precedent in the church. When the Holy Father has more discussion about ordaining women deaconesses, uh, to pick up in that tradition. Now I'm going to show you some of the items that we have in the church. And so we'll walk around a bit and see these things. These are our relics of St. Stephen both in the glass, the chips of bone here, and then there's a statue of St. Stephen, and he's holding the stones of his martyrdom. And then next to him, 
are the relics and figures of St. Lawrence. There's two bones of St. Lawrence here. This is an icon of him as the Archdeacon of Rome. And then this is a more famous depiction of Lawrence, because the part about Lawrence that I didn't mention was that when he didn't turn in the treasures of the church and then brought the poor instead, the magistrate was so infuriated that he had him roasted alive on a gridiron, for which he became the uh, patron of cooks. Also, there's a famous joke attributed to uh, St. Lawrence. He said at one point, I think I'm done well enough on this side, you can turn me over. So he had a lot of bravado, and he was certainly remembered as one of the most beloved saints in Roman history even though he was a Spaniard. Now the remains of Lawrence and Stephen are both buried together in the church of San Lorenzo in Rome. Now we'll come over here for a moment. One of the six deacons of Rome who was martyred with Pope Sixtus II and who was a companion of St. Lawrence was St. Magnus. So you see here a figure of St. Magnus, the deacon, and here's one of his vertebrates. And that's one of the rare relics that you can date the exact day that he died, August 6th of 258. I think I said earlier, August 7th, it's August 6th. And now we're gonna come over and look at the third famous deacon. I mentioned St. Vincent of Saragossa was Lawrence's cousin. You see Vincent is here. He's dressed in a Delmatic, which is the vestment that you see Deacon Tony wear when we're going formally. It's a Deacon's Delmatic. And you see that he's holding grapes. And there are grapes at his feet because he's the patron of the wine industry. Now here's a, a sample, a little figurine showing you what the Chalice of Valencia looks like. Now the cup of the Last Supper would have been just this part. It was an agate cup, a little bigger than this. The chalice is bigger than that. And there's a picture of it down here. Now you see Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI both celebrating 